me burning questions. Um, is any, I can't remember if any of you guys are Prince uh, readers and uh, Eaton fans. Um, I don't think, oh, maybe Rachel. Um, I just wanted to put this out there if you missed it this week. Um, Prince has gone back to not every day being updated um, just mm. because events in my personal life have taken a turn, which means that I don't have as much time to write and I'm very, very behind on my schedule right now. And I had to make a choice earlier this week about um, one of the books had to had to fail win-win which is the event that they do for us authors uh, where every time you open a privileged chapter and read it uh, the book gets a point and Prince was the lowest on the scale for that and also has the smallest readership um, and I was just out of time so I did put a chapter up that day but it wasn't long enough the win-win uh, chapters have to be, or, or day, in a day you have to do a minimum of 1,500 words. So generally I do two 1,000 to 1,500 uh, word chapters per day on each of the Beast books and then an additional chapter on Prince, um, but Prince did not get its full word count that day. So it failed win-win. If you do it, if you fail it once, you're out. Um, and that led to a conversation with my husband just about everything that's going on. Um, he wasn't super excited that I had gone back to three books because I had done that earlier this year and it was really hard. And with everything else that has happened over the past couple weeks, um, it was just unfortunately, it was time to make a decision. And that was the, economically, that was the wisest decision to make. And I feel really bad because I committed to doing that one again for July. And if you are listening to this and you supported it, I want you to know that I am not unaware that I made a commitment and then backed out. Um, I do want you to know that some stuff has come up that I did not see coming. Um, and I am getting behind on all of my books right now. So Prince was basically the first, first man to fall. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm not stopping it completely. I'm just putting it to the last priority which means that I have to get Beast and Queen uh, I have to get their schedules back up to date uh, so that I have a buffer of time and as soon as I do that then any extra time that I have will go into Prince um, because the book is connecting with people even if it doesn't have a huge readership the readers that it has are connecting with it and I'm excited about that and I love love that book and love those characters so I'm not stopping it completely, but it is not going to have daily updates. And sometimes that may mean it doesn't have updates for several days, or it might mean it gets a bunch of chapters all at once and then not get any for a while. We will see. We will discover it together. <laughs> um, I love it. Yeah. Somebody has somebody else. Oh, Kathy's here. Oh, I'm here. Yay. It's me. Good to see you again. Good to be here. I have, I asked before you came, if anybody has any questions, did you have, did you come with any questions today or were you just coming to hang out? You know what? I did come with questions and I put my questions somewhere and I forgot my questions were. You sound like me. <laughs> <laughs> They're somewhere. I'll find them. I have a notebook somewhere with a bunch of notes for citrus and I don't know where it is now. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. Exactly. Jinx. <laughs> oh, I found my questions. My questions were related to um, uh, the Beast series. Go for it. Um, I was wondering if predators are more reluctant to give their throats to, like, their predator mate versus, like, a prey to a prey. Like an equine to an equine. Is it there's like a difference in a comfort level. What there's a difference is in the level of dominance. So the more dominant, and you can be a dominant in any tribe. So for mm -hmm. example, Baron is very dominant, but he's an equine. Um, mm -hmm. And there are wolves and, and lions that are 
what what we would call beta or lower down the hierarchy that aren't super dominant. Um, so the resistance, if you're thinking of queen or even ref, uh, mm -hmm. with Elia, the resistance that you see or the battle that they're having is that to a dominant, that is the last, like that's the last sign of submission. Um, when somebody truly submits, they give their throat because they're basically offering you're allowed to kill me if you want to. So it's the last surrender, so to speak. Um, okay. And so then it, was, it seemed like it was much easier for um, uh, Gary, uh, I'm saying the name right? Yes. Well, it's, I call him Cute. Gary, but... Gary, to give his throat, like it seemed... Actually, this is, this is an interesting thing with him and you're going to see it play out more. He is dominant, but he is so... Um, sort of racked with self-doubt and insecurity um, that he doesn't put his so so for example I don't know if you've read there's a there's a section where Ref is uh, with the elders and under a challenge and he and, and Lucan's there and Ref is thinking uh, in the narrative that Lucan thinks that Ref is the most dominant person in the room and he's not Brant is, mm -hmm. but Lucan doesn't realize that because Brant doesn't use his dominance. He does not want to be the alpha, right? So, yeah. Uh, and Reth knows this about Brant. They have a history with this when, when Reth was young. Um, so with, with Gari, what he's doing is he's um, not using the dominance that he has. He has not functioned in the position of dominance that he could take if he were to try to. Um, and he also is so, uh, has been always so desiring to have a true mate and, and make that connection that for him, it was actually an emotional decision. He was just there. He's just in it okay. by the time he'd make, cause he fought before that, like he fought the urge to even make that connection in the first place. Cause he's afraid of what it's going to, how it's going to conflict with mm -hmm. his vows to Reth and Elia. Um, okay. so he what you're right he gave it up a lot easier but the reason was for him emotional as opposed to a, a dominance issue like he was all there Callie could do anything with him and he wouldn't care mm -hmm. <laughs> but you'll get to see his dominance more because his confidence is going to grow as a result of being in a relationship with her and so his dominance is going to grow with it like he's going to use it more as mm -hmm. he develops as a person. So I'm excited for to get to that part of the story because he's still kind of in this reeling, spinning phase of trying to figure out what's actually happening. And and he's, he's so conflicted right now and so messed up. But um, it's going to be fun to see him start to kind of flex a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, my last question then is if Elrith wind up being human versus um, Lannan, would she still be accepted or would she have not been accepted? Would she have been seen like she was uh, disformed? No, she would be accepted. Human Humans are actually a tribe to the anima. But the thing is, because the tribes split from the human world way back when, Historically, most of the anima don't actually know their own history. I know their history, but they don't. Um, and they, you're going to get some of that through Gari and, and Callie's work. You're going to find out some stuff that you don't know yet. But um, so historically, which is why they're included in the right of survival. Historically, humans were just another tribe, or at least by the anima, they were seen as just another tribe. So it used to be that, that there was no distinction made. Um, but when they split off, um, the anima um, started in, uh, well, not. because of that historical connection, they've, the hum, human tribe, quote unquote, has always been a part of anima history, which is why it's included in things like the right of survival. But because it's been so long, hundreds of years since the humans actually had a presence in anima, um, they are, they have this weird place in, in sort of anima psyche where 
they aren't a tribe, but they are a tribe. So they're seen as a tribe that doesn't live with us because there's more of those. And, and I'm, if, if the beast, if anima continues to be successful as a world, I'm actually going to write another series that's set in a different part of anima where the animals are different and they don't know each other. So Reth's wildwood anima don't know these other anima. But oh, so they're like other, like kings and like other, like almost like other like countries type. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't. They're not aware of each other because they're separated, and they don't travel. Um, they, in my mind, at least, at least with Reth's, Reth's anima, um, they have a limited territory, um, and that is the only quote unquote land that they know. Um, and there's oceans and all sorts of things. It's not as big as Earth, but it's it's large. And there's other, I guess, continents would be the right word. Um, so because I couldn't bring in all of the animals that I would like to do, because it would just get too confusing and too much, um, my plan is to do other books with other animals in other areas of Anima. But they are completely unaware of Wildwood and Reth's section of anima. They have no connection with them at all. At least most of them. Most of them don't know. There's one or two that are clever. So is that where, like, the scene where the, the, the lion silent one who seemed to have been, like, previously took a human because of the way he was reacting? So is that, like, where that came from? No. So this is something that I obviously have not explained well in the narrative because I keep getting questions about the silent ones. Um, the silent ones in like the vast majority of the silent ones are just animals. They're just animals, just like we have on earth. So a, 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 a lion in the human world would be a silent one if it was taken to anima. And when they call them silent ones, it's because they mean they don't, they don't speak. They don't, they don't speak English. They don't become human and talk. Um, they are just animal. Um, and, but what you do have among the animals are a small portion uh, of some of them that are anima who went silent which means uh, either the an either the anima lost control of their beast and was never able to get it back and eventually just became permanently in their beast form or there are some cases where it's effectively a form of anima suicide where the person has given over to their beast and chooses never to take their human form again. They live as an animal and the reason they choose to do it is because it separates them somewhat from their humanity. Um, they're still aware of what's going on but they are less um, engaged and the longer they stay in beast form the more animalistic they become. So there's conjecture as to whether eventually they just become animals anyway. But certainly psychologically, uh, the reason there's a few anima who've chosen to do that is because they are so uh, either distraught or for whatever reason they're trying to escape. And so they choose to take their beast form and never go back. Um, so that's why anima do treat animals as animals. They do eat meat and all of that sort of thing. But they're always a little aware, especially with ones like that silent one that Reth dealt with. And you are actually going to see over the course of Beast and then in Queen, you're going to get the answer as to what was odd about that one. That was some early foreshadowing that okay. will, will pan out later. But that one had a specific issue. But... Um, that's why the anima are always just a little bit aware. They treat the, the animals with respect and see them as sort of ancestor almost um, because there was a mingling of human and animal um, blood, so to speak. So when they see a silent one, they're aware that there's a very small chance that that could be um, an anima uh, and they don't know it because the person's gone silent. Um, but they also know it's very rare, so it, it doesn't generally, unless they had some reason to believe, like, the, the thing did something specific, 
um, they would they would assume that it was animal because most of them are. Mm. Um, but yeah, that one wasn't it wasn't human because if it was human when it died, it would have gone back to its human form. Oh, okay, and that was just a line. That's the thing. If you if you look at um, any of the times, like when Reth killed Lucan and Lucine both, when they die, they go back to their human form because their human form is their real form. The beast form is not their real form. Um, so when they die, they lose their connection with the beast. They go back to their humanity. Um, and that's what you see. So, yeah, if you ever see a silent one killed and it doesn't turn back into a human, then it's just an animal. Um, so Shelly has a question. She says, um, how did Elia get her beast? Did she have it already, or was it from Red's blood when she was hurt? It's actually from a combination of things, and I'm not going to tell you all of them, because that is coming up in the book pretty soon. Um, Gary, Gary, and Kelly are going to uh, develop a theory on that, and Amora is going to help a little bit, too, with Reth. Um but you'll see at the, so we're in volume two for Beast now. By the end of that, I believe you will understand exactly what's happened to her and how um, and, and whether or not she'll keep it. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to explain that out today because I want you guys to read it. <laughs> so are you going to do a volume three? Yes. The question awesome. I have about volume three is how long it's going to be. Um, because I know the end of volume two and I have an idea for volume three, um, but until I start writing it, which I can't do yet, I don't know whether it's going to be fairly brief or whether it's going to be another long, you know, 300 chapters um, or 200 chapters. So everything seems to be taking longer than I expected it to. So I'm guessing it won't be short. <laughs> But, um, yeah, my only question about Volume 3 is how long it'll be. I'm not sure if it'll be as long as the first two. Um, Rachel has a question. She says, or it's not really a question. She says, I hope that Aaron's mom doesn't go down that path. I think Silent One path. I think that's what she's talking about. Oh, right. Yeah, Aaron's mom is, I really feel for her. I used to suffer from depression, and she she had it really bad. She had it really bad. And she um, was able to shake it off to a degree uh, when Aaron was about 10, I think. I can't remember. I don't have my notes in front of me. But um, when he was still a child, she was able to sort of come alive again a little bit. Um, but she's falling back into that now. And, and events are going to play out with her and Aaron over the course of the next hundred chapters or so. Maybe not even that many, I'm not sure. But yeah, hers is definitely a difficult mm -hmm. storyline. It's going to cause a lot of pain for Aaron because it's a lot of unresolved stuff from when he was a kid. Stuff that he just kind of let go and never actually faced. Um, and he's being confronted with it now because it's happening again. So now he's kind of got the dual... You know, part of it is that he's... Um, tried to forget a lot of what happened back then um, and now he's going to be forced to remember but then the other side of it is that he's now an adult and he's got to face what his mother put him through as a child now that he's an adult and can better understand um, you know what should have happened and didn't so he's going to have to deal with um that, as I'm sure all of us have been through before with our parents, we always get a better understanding as we grow up of things that they did right and things that they did wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to see him. He's going to have a real emotional journey with this whole thing. But it'll be good for him. So we're going to learn more about Sharon. Sharon is Aaron's dad. No, I meant like the story, like what happened. Like we don't yes. know because yes. they trade her. Yes. 
So his full story will happen in, or, or the full explanation of his story. I'm trying to remember how I did it. You're actually going to see pieces of it in both books. So in, in Beast, you'll see one side of it. Um, and in Queen, you'll see another side. Um, his story is kind of unique. Um, so what I'm, what I'm doing is on, in the Beast side, you'll see why he gets called a traitor. You'll see why that was never, um, like Aaron was never pulled aside and told him, said, you know, your dad's not a traitor. And there's a reason for that. And so in the Beast book, you'll see why. Um, but in the Queen book, you'll see kind of the other side of it, um, what was going on. And um, yeah, so you'll get the full story if you read both books. But um, because I'm trying not to spoil beast in queen i had to kind of give him a different spin so that way if you read one you can still get surprised in the other and then they all make sense together that's, the, that's so cool that's the idea I love that. you can you can you can tell me later if i actually pull it off <laughs> but that's the idea okay uh rachel asks um, is there a possibility that a disformed could go through something either traumatic or very life-threatening that could actually force them to shift, breaking whatever keeps them from shifting normally? So the shift thing is really interesting because there's a couple different ways it gets triggered. Uh, one is when they're highly emotional and young. So when an anima is born, they often shift um, as babies. In fact, they all shift as babies except the disformed. At some point, very, very early on, sometimes even during the birth process, the baby shifts. And so people know this is an anima who can shift. Um, and knowing that, they then parent the child, um, teaching them how to control the beast. Because just like with animals and uh, it, real animals, a child or, or you know, a cub or a pup or a chick is a lot easier to control than an adult right so um, while they're young are still young they're teaching them when they shift how to take control and um, manage their beast and then be able to shift back into human form because the beast is not the human so when an anima shifts, they're giving a, a, an element of control away to the beast. And the problem with that is the more dominant the beast, the harder it is for the human to wrestle control back. Um, so they, they have a relationship with their beast that they develop over time. So a normal anima over the course of their lifetime develops this relationship with their beast where they can control it really easily and they can choose when they will or won't shift but the only time that that kind of gets challenged sometimes when their instincts are kicked in really strongly so for example with Reth when um, Elia when he and Elia had walked the flames and smoke and he was all he already knew she was his true mate so there's an instinctive thing there um, on top of that, he's dominant, which means that his, his animalistic side wants to uh, take her to mark her so she is his, so to speak. So there's a, there's a sort of base instinct there to do that. And then on top of that, as the king and the alpha, um, it's very important to him um, personally to make her his queen and that doesn't become official quote unquote until they've consummated the the mate um so there was a lot of emotional reasons and instinctive reasons in him to mate with her but she didn't know that and he knew that she didn't know that he knew enough about the way humans think to know that she was not going to immediately assume we should sleep together um and so he was fighting this instinct that was in him because he is so dominant 
uh, he was fighting the instinct to take her. And because it was such an emotional battle for him, that made him weaker to his beast. So his beast was trying to come through and just take her. Because that's what an animal would do. <laughs> uh, he would just he would just do it. Um, so when you saw him fighting against the shift, that's not normally what happens. Normally he has control of his beast and he can choose to shift or not. But every so often when they get super emotional or when there's something that kicks their animal instincts into high gear, the beast fights them to come out and then they have a, a little wrestling match on their hands. And like I say, for most animals, most of the time, it's not really a big deal, but you'll see when they get super angry um, or super uh, defensive, so um, especially with the, with the predators, but with any, like, maybe parent to child or mate to mate, if they see somebody that they that is very important to them in danger, they will often, the beast wants to come through to protect Um or to flee. So like with the equine, when they're prey, their natural instinct isn't to fight. Their natural instinct is to flee. So the beast wants to come through and get them out of there. So you'll see them sometimes uh, when they want to protect either themselves or something else that they're fighting the shift. Uh, because the human can rationalize what's going on, but the beast can't. The beast just runs on emotion and instinct. Um, so I have a question about the... Um equines being like the police or the guards if their animal wants to flee did they become like guards because they're like a taller stronger type human is that why so what's happened with the equines is um oh, i'm just going to tell you uh rachel really quick yes very traumatic and very life-threatening things uh, could could make their beast try to push through. So depending how strong they are against their beast, it might get forced. Um, but more often than even if they're disformed, no. Oh, disformed, right? Disformed, no. Disformed cannot shift. Not in their disformed state, they cannot shift. They are not physically capable of it. So they have a beast, and it's within them, and the instincts are there but they cannot make the physical shift. And you are going to find out in Gary's story why. That I'm really excited for you guys <laughs> to see. Um, you're going to find out in Gary's story why, and then in Queen, you're going to see um, how that kind of plays out. Anyway, I can't, I can't really talk about it without giving spoilers, so sorry. I just wanted to let you know. So no, Disformed will never shift, not as they currently are. Um, so sorry, Citrus, you were asking me about, I'm sorry, I lost it. Oh, why the equine oh. are guards? Yes. So the thing with horses, horses are something that I grew up with. And the thing, horses are just like any other animal. You have a spectrum of how uh, dominant they are. And they do run in a herd hierarchy. Usually what you have is a stallion who can be very aggressive. Um and generally is, is the only truly aggressive animal in the herd. But then you'll often have two or three mares that are, um, one in particular, but usually two or three mares, there's kind of a hierarchy or pecking order, and they are stronger than the others and uh, mentally. Um, so I was kind of basing it on that idea. Within the equine, you have a, a portion of them that are uh, naturally strong and aggressive. And they are not only um, willing to flee, but also very willing to fight. And they have the instincts to fight. If you, if you ever meet or get the opportunity to be around actual stallions, uh, that's male horses that haven't been castrated when they were young, um, they are far more aggressive and far more um, hostile, usually. Some of them are, are calmer, but a lot of them are way more hostile. Um, than normal horses um, and so the the equine guards and soldiers are naturally more dominant males to begin with but because they are prey they also have this kind of balancing where um, they are they're they're very good at, at 
determining is this a time to fight or is this a time to flee so they make good guards and soldiers because they're not just like kill them all you know the wolves oh. if you're watching what's going on later on in beast the wolves are predators and so their natural instinct always their first instinct is to fight for what they want uh, whereas equines are far more what we would call rational or uh, balanced where they look at the situation and say, is this a time to fight or is this a time to run? Which is why Baron will often be with Reth and like, we got to get out of here. <laughs> and Reth's like, no. Oh. <laughs> so Baron's always fighting a battle with Reth about, because uh, Reth's natural instinct is get in there and get it done, you know. Um, and that's why I love the scene, even though it was actually a really horrible scene. I love the scene where Baron tripped Reth to stop him getting to the cave first when they were going back to find out what had happened to Elia. It makes me laugh every time I read it because it's just, to me in my mind, like there was a history with this where Baron will do this since they were kids, you know, since they were teenagers and, and early they were just, they were just best friends back then. But it's been Baron's kind of go-to whenever Reth's sort of running off thoughtlessly because Baron can run faster and he's got longer legs so he'll he'll just throw a he'll just hook Reth's ankle and make him tumble so he can get ahead of him and and get in and see what needs to be done um, because he's very protective of Reth and he knows that Reth because of Reth's dominance will just run into something and sure he can probably handle it but you know the one time he can't um, it's going to be a problem so Baron's always trying to get ahead of him or stay ahead of him. Um, and most of the time, Reth is good when things aren't super emotional. Most of the time, he's good to hang back and let Baron sort of measure what they should do, because that's that's what Baron's good at. Um, but in situations like that, where Elia was in danger, Reth was just like, he didn't care. He was just going. And Baron's like, no, you're not. <laughs> I got to get in there and see what's going on. Um, so yeah, so the reason the equines are the guards is because they have that balance. They're very good. They're not scared. They're dominant. They're not scared. They're willing to fight. They're willing to kill. Um, but they don't immediately, that's not their first instinct to do that. So they'll, they'll, they'll measure the situation and decide what's the best thing to do. And predators that are around them, because they're dominant, there's a natural uh, respect but uh, in, in, within anima hierarchy, like the anima as a whole, it's a pure dominance hierarchy, right? So you have each tribe has their alpha or their, 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 their strongest dominant person. Um, but even below them, there would be several herds or packs or family groups. And each of those has an alpha as well and so on and so forth so you get this hierarchy ladder that goes right at the top all the way down within each tribe to the to the youngest smallest child um, that's also true of the anima as a whole so anima instinctively measure each other's dominance um, and the ones that are not dominant they just go along they're bottom rung people that doesn't mean that they're um, poorly treated it just means they don't fight to be in control so all of the alphas of all the different tribes, um, a lot of them are on the Security Council and the elders and stuff like that. But they, um, even within them, there's a hierarchy. So Reth is at the top, technically, but like I said before, Brant's actually more dominant than Reth. Um, but Brant doesn't use his dominance, he doesn't want to be in charge, um, so he only uses it to basically to bring Reth or anybody else who's around that needs it into line when they're getting out of line. Um, depending how far you are into the book, you'll have seen Brant do that with Reth uh, when Lucan brought the petition against him. So um, it's really just a matter of whenever anima are together, they are instinctively measuring each other's dominance. So if there was a group of anima and they were from four different tribes and they all decided, you know, they're all 20 years old, they decide they're going to go camping together. They're just walking down the road. They know within themselves who is the most dominant and who is the lowest. And that natural pecking order just happens 
to them. Like they can just instinctively measure that and wherever they go, the person who's at the top of the hierarchy is the leader. And that happens with every group and every gathering all the time. They don't even think about it. It's just part of themselves. So when you see like uh, Gari was talking to Elia about the table full of female pride members and getting her to try to figure out who was dominant, all of the lionesses there, they all knew that, I think it was Hunter was the one that was there at the time, but um, they all knew within themselves what the what the hierarchy order was. Um, Elia just, she doesn't have those natural instincts. She has to observe and kind of get some cues to figure out how it's working. Um, but, be, but she can do that by watching the other anima and how they treat each other. She can figure out who's, who's what. But children learn that from when they're really young. So they don't even, it's just natural for them. Oh, somebody, Love asked, it. somebody asked me about the human tribe and I forgot to tell you. Um, you're, you're going to see in Queen, you're going to see those histories come out and some of that stuff actually start to play out in anima. So you will actually get to see that, how that works with the human tribe, quote unquote, um, versus anima tribes. Um, because within the anima themselves, uh, each tribe kind of has purposes and things that they're good at and things that they do for the anima as a whole. Um, and you're going to get an opportunity to see how the human human tribe, quote unquote, work into that later on. Probably volume two, <laughs> maybe volume three. Depends how long that book goes. Is there any a question? question? Oh, yeah. Um... Okay, so the, the best way I know how to ask my question is kind of like an example. And I'm hoping you can figure out what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so, like, take, like, the birds. Mm -hmm. Within them, do you have, like, a group of, like, sparrows and hawks and owls and, like, there's different, because, like, like, a hawk would be very predatory, but, like, a sparrow would be, like, you know, very prey-like. Are there, like, um, stratifications like that that occur? And, like, also whenever they, like, shift, do they all shift into the same thing? Or is there, like, a difference? There is a difference when they shift. Um, I didn't go quite as detailed as hawk versus sparrow, um, but that that's a, actually a really good way to explain it. In my mind, that's actually determined by the dominance factor. But you're you're right; it would it would be that type of difference between them. So it's not that when they shift. So one of the things that's interesting about the birds in particular is they are a form of animal that's normally very small. Um, and so when they shift into birds, they're huge compared to an actual uh, like you know eagle, for example. Um, there's very few birds that are large enough in the natural world to look the way the birds do when they shift, which is why when the birds are in shift and form, the animal can tell the difference between an anima and a normal bird. So yes, there is stratifications would be a good word for it, but it comes based on their dominance as opposed to breeds or species, but they do look different. They're just like us. so. Some have different colors, some have different markings, different colored eyes, different colored beaks. Um, you know, some are bigger than others. Um, but no, I haven't based it on breeds. I didn't go that far. I just made them unique. Um, but their aggression, I guess, is based on their dominance. So the birds are a good example of a tribe that has a really broad spectrum. So the Predators, natural predators like lions and wolves, even their members that are lowest on the dominance ladder are often higher in the overall um, anima dominance than the prey would be. So things like your sheep and goats are super 
with beta pretty much across the board. They have some dominant members, but most of the time uh, they are pretty peaceful. Um, so most of, for example, the sheep would in dominance hierarchy be lower than even some of the lower wolves because the wolves are extremely dominant um, and, the, and the lions as well. Um, so with the birds though, they have, a, they have probably the broadest spectrum of aggression or, or dominance through the, through the tribe. So you have some birds that are highly dominant and, um, and, you know, to the point, and, and I was, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about predator birds like eagles and hawks and stuff like that, but I wasn't sort of modeling the anima on those specific breeds. I was just thinking, okay, what, what do I know of birds? You, you, you picked a good comparison, sparrows versus hawks. Okay, so our dominant birds are the more predator breeds or species and the, the less dominant birds are the, you know, the, the sparrows. And then you got ones in the middle that are like owls, and, you know, you just, it's, I didn't get super detailed with the birds because they're not central to the story, but they are in my mind the tribe that has the biggest spectrum. No, that's really, no, it makes, it makes sense. I was just curious, like, about, like, the spectrum and, because I think it would also be, like, fascinating. Like, I'm fascinated by all these friendships yeah. that you let us see and just, like, you know, what if, like, spontaneously they're all like, hey, guys, let's, like, you know, if you had, like, a bunch of kids and they're like, let's play a game, but it's like, whoa, I did not know that's what you were going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Wait, you're a what? <laughs> they, they, because they scent, they know. Oh, that's what true. Each other are just by meeting, even when they're in human form, they know what each other are, which is why they're all not all of them, but why a lot of, especially the older ones, are a little bit shaky with the disformed because the disformed smell different, so they can tell which tribe they're from, but their their scent is not what what an animal would describe as for example not a true wolf or not a true horse they know which tribe it is but it's got something about it that's a little bit off um and they don't know why gary gary and callie are going to find out why um but yeah so yeah they would know each other in terms of what tribe they are but you're right they wouldn't know if they hadn't met before they often because they because because anima don't think being in your beast form is, that, that, that's like, it's not the highest level of functioning, so to speak. So they use the beast form uh, on a practical level, usually either to fight or to travel. That's generally when a, when a uh, anima is shifting, they're doing it for one of those two reasons, either to get out of there quickly or because they're going to fight. Um, because their animal has more, you know, fangs and claws and, and whatnot. Um, so, but because that, because of that, some anima will go months or years without shifting if, if their job doesn't require it. Um, so they often, unless they have intimate relationships with each other, you know, I'm just trying to think of an example. Gari, for example, is not going to uh, know what uh you know citizen number three's bird form looks like because he hasn't seen him shift before but he is going to know what baron's um shifted form is because he's been around baron a lot and they're in the same tribe and baron's also in a role where he has to shift a lot so it's just like anything else in our relationships it depends what your proximity is to the person and and what they do how familiar you become with their shifted form but also their scent as well because the beast scent is different to the human scent but it has the thread of the human scent in it so if they get a chance to scent them they'll be able to tell usually which human it is um but you know they have to be paying attention they're just like us just because they can see something or can smell something doesn't mean they're paying attention to it so they might see a, a shifted bird fly overhead that doesn't mean they're going to go oh that's such and such they'd have to pay attention 
be able to get the scent of it first of all from the winds and all of that um but also you know care enough to actually parse it out <laughs> i'm that's one thing that i wonder i do wonder i've always wondered this about like my dogs and stuff too i imagine scent in terms of a, a sense like when you look at things you can see 15 different things at once you can see different colors and different shapes and all of that so i i had to, because i don't have a great nose i had to kind of figure out okay how am i gonna how, how do humans who function on a scent like they're, they're they they trust their sense of smell because they have a heightened sense of smell how does that work and i thought the only thing that i could come close to was when i'm cooking and there's three different things in the pot and if i pay attention i can identify the individual scents of onions um, garlic and tomato for example but if I'm not paying attention, it just smells like pasta sauce. So that's what I'm <laughs> very loosely basing all of their stuff when they talk about the threat of a scent. You know, they're, they're like, there's a threat of fear in the scent. Or there's a, I'm aware that apparently dogs, and I've seen it with my dog, they can sense different emotion and tension and anxiety and stuff because apparently your scent changes, your hormones and pheromones and whatnot get going and they can they can actually sense those tiny tiny shifts uh, in you even if you're not showing it in your body or your body language um, and so that's kind of how I imagine the animal work if they're paying attention they can they can gather a great deal from your smell but they have to be paying attention and that's how they can lie to each other and stuff sometimes is that if if the person trusts another another anima they're not scenting them for truth. That's why you'll see uh, at different times, you'll see a character say to another, scent me true. Because what they're saying is pay attention right now and and look for the markers in my scent that would tell you that I'm lying. Because they're not going to be there. I'm telling you they're not going to be there. So, you know, it's just like us. If we're, if we're not really watching a person, we're not really thinking, we just take what they say, it's no big deal. But if you think somebody might be lying to you, you pay attention, you look at them. And that's what they're doing. Just a second. I'm just being interrupted. One minute. I hope you guys didn't hear that. <laughs> no, we're getting... Okay, good. Sorry. <clears throat> My husband was just being suggestive. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Rachel asked me, "Do we hear any more of Rant Amora's story?" I think Amora's story is going to come out. Um, I know it, and I think it's going to get relayed. Um, but there's been a few different things that I thought were going to come out and didn't. So we'll see. But I think you will. Brant, I don't know. He doesn't. He's not got a super dramatic story. He's just a cool guy. I like him a lot. Um, and I think a few of their details will also come out in Queen because they were effectively grandparents to uh, Elrith. So she knows a lot about them that a lot of other anima don't know. She was really close to both of them. So it wouldn't surprise me if their stories didn't come out in hers as well because... Reth's there to be the wise guiding father <laughs> to Elrith. Were you guys around? There was somebody that commented. Maybe it was one of you. I don't know. There was somebody that commented um, early on in Queen when uh, Reth sort of pulled Aaron aside for a, a male-to-male -male talk. Um, the reference that I used for Reth from, from Aaron's perspective, Aaron was seeing him as this older guy he says you know so he's looking at the older man and one of the readers commented no this is my wrath he's not old <laughs> you know, and i was laughing um because i realized i can like i've always had rest full story in my head so i've always seen him across the across from like 20 well i've seen him since he was 15 right through till he's like 60 so he's always been that full person 
in my mind. So I didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about how that might kill it a little bit for some people reading Queen. Because he's a quote unquote older man. But he's a hot older man. He's a silver Very hot fox. Man. <sighs> That's what I think they call it. <laughs> see, in my world, I don't see him as having, like, physically looking the same as, like, a human would at 60. I mean, I figure he looks younger, trimmer, fitter. Definitely fitter and not as gray. But he is graying. So when uh, in Elra's story at the beginning of Queen, I see him as around 50. So he okay, he's, that's he's a little more here. wrinkled, but he's still very, like she describes him at one point, he's still very muscular. So like you think about it with animals, um, when they age, it's not usually, unless they get super old, it's not usually until right at the end of their lives that you're like, oh, that's an old dog. Like they look young for a long time. And then they kind of go downhill <laughs> at the end with the grays and the saggy tummy and stuff like that. So I kind of figure with anima, with the health, the healthy lifestyle that they have and the physical strength that they have, they are, like if you look at Brant in Beast, even though he's older, and Amora too, she's actually got gray streaked through her hair. Um, even though they're older, they're still very vital. They're still very active and uh, fit. But you can tell the difference between the pace, or at least in my mind, I can. I can tell the difference between the pace that Brant would keep as opposed to what Reth does. Because Brant is old enough that he's starting to slow down. And he's seen as um, more, he, he's seen as elderly by the anima. He doesn't feel that way to us because to them, the elderly just means somebody who's got a lot of life experience behind them. Because they don't generally get old in the way that we think of them where they they're frail and they can't do anything um, they stay vital most of their lives so rest never i'm never going to write wrath as a you know frail old doddering guy with a no. walking cane <laughs> well i i think of wrath in older wrath in uh queen i think of him as being like to me, like sexier, like more attractive. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's to do with age and being a parent, something about him being older, more experienced, more distinguished, his maturity. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm older myself. I'm middle-aged. So to me, he is far more attractive in Queen. Like he's a fuller person. Yeah. Because he's got life experience. I mean, he's already a good and wise man. Like he's a good guy and, and he's hot as hell in mm -hmm. King of Beasts. But he's young enough that he's still making rash decisions at times and getting emotional and stuff like that. Whereas in Queen, I see him a lot more steady and a lot mm -hmm. more thoughtful. Um, and very definitely being a parent has made him less self-absorbed as well. I mean, he was never a bad guy, but he can be cocky and he can be um, a little bit, mm -hmm. not a little bit, a lot. He can be very oblivious at times. And so he can get really focused on his little world and his little group of people and not really be thinking outside of that. Whereas becoming a parent grew him in that way. And he's far more, in Queen, he's far more focused on the good of others than the good of himself. He's, he's really taken on that sense of... of um, pride leader so to speak where he's mm -hmm. you know because in in king of beasts you get to see the good side of him because he's so concerned for the safety of elia um and stuff like that but if you if you sat back and looked at him as a person who wasn't in his close circle he's a nice guy and he's a thoughtful man but he's he's doing his thing and and you don't really get to say so Whereas in Queen, he's become a true sort of father to the people where he's become an actual parent and learned to, to give himself for the good of others. But also in the wider sense, he was willing to give up his own uh, power for what he believed to be the good of the people as a whole. He would not have made that decision. He didn't understand that decision when he talks about his father doing that with him. 
he didn't get it. He didn't want it. He wanted his dad to stick around, and that was because he saw his father so much bigger and stronger than himself. He was just like, why would you even do that? By the time we get to Queen, he's got he's figured out why his father would do that, and he's making the same decision with Elrith because of his father's example. So, um, yeah, I, I, I find him uh, far more attractive on a, on a human level uh, in Queen. Because I think there's more to him. He's never been a bad guy. He's always been a good one. Um, Shelly had a question earlier. Um, when we're talking about uh, the beast taking over, she said, is their beast like a spirit animal? No. Um, the beast is a real, tangible animal. Um, and they are... Uh, I'm trying to figure out what the right word would be. There's a connection between them and this animal. They're not fully independent. Um, but without spoiling the story, it's hard to get into the intricacies of how that happens and why and what it means for them. But but the short story is um, that the beast is, uh, it's a supernatural connection. But it's not a spirit animal. My understanding, and I would not be in any way an expert, so don't take my word for this. My understanding of spirit animal is, um, is the belief that there is a a, a way of thinking or a way of functioning that is represented by this animal that you sort of embody and where they see a supernatural manifestation of that it's separate to the person themselves the anima oh, beasts, yes. the anima beasts are an actual animal a physical tangible animal but there's a connection between them and the human so uh, for example when Reth's lion got raked. Uh, Reth himself got the injury when he shifted back. He still had the injury. So there's a there's a direct connection between them, um, and that connection is supernatural. But I don't want to get into the intricacies of it because you'll get to see that all of that's going to be explained. I did see another question here. Will we hear what happened to Reth to cause him to force El to take Queen Early? Yes, we will, eventually. Um, all of the different sort of threads that are that are getting revealed right now in Queen, there's one or two more to come out. But once they do, then you're going to start seeing them all tie together. And Reth's aware of a lot of them, but not all of them. But the ones that he's not aware of still tie in. He just wasn't aware of them. So, um, and and there is connections between all this. So if you're not reading Queen, the different threads you're seeing, uh, Reth um, essentially uh, <laughs> baits his daughter into taking dominance. Um, and the reason he does that is uh, because of where he sees the people going and what he believes she's going to be able to achieve that he cannot. So his intention is good. Um, and right now in the story, there's three or four different <coughs> little plot things that are going on that seem like they're unrelated, but you're going to find out that they're all related. Um, and they're actually tying back into King of Beasts and stuff that's going on right now for Rath and Elia um, in their story. So Reth's been aware of the wider issue this whole time. By the time you get to Queen, Reth's been aware of this wider issue for, for 20 years or so um, and was working on trying to work it out himself. And as he's gotten older, he's seen that his, he thinks his daughter is going to be better at this than he is. And that's actually why he, he did this. But I don't want to get into the specifics because I want, I, want, I want you to get the surprises, what I hope will be the surprises. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're reading Beast and you haven't read, read Queen yet, don't worry. Because if you're reading Beast, you're actually going to get the foundation of all this stuff first. And then when you read Queen, you're going to start seeing it. You're, 
you're when you read queen you're going to go wait what about and then you're going to see it come through so in theory you could read either one first and still have new surprises come out that's the idea he's so good at that just organizing all the different stories making it entertaining i love it well thank it's you magic wait, i haven't i haven't delivered yet <laughs> There's well, you delivered on CEO, and, so I trust actual, you. <laughs> actual delivery, but yeah, the, the the idea is that basically there's a there's a there's a singular issue uh, that the anima, as a general, are not aware of, and uh, Gari and Elia and Callie are all going to become aware of it, and and tell and in turn inform Wrath. Um, and then in Queen, you're actually going to see it come to fruition. So, we shall see. We'll see if I can pull it off. Okay, so, this has got a question for me then. When you switch from writing one book to the other, do you kind of have to, like, shut yourself off in on that story? And then shift, like, close the book on it, so to say? That when you're like, okay, now I'm doing Queen. So it depends. So like if I'm writing prints, I have to shut off the beast stories because they have different metaphors and different vernacular and all of that. And sometimes it creeps in. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen it, but there's been a couple different times when I've used the wrong character names <laughs> in the wrong book <laughs> because there's similar characters and I've messed it up. But um, So if I'm switching worlds, I have to shut off the other books. So what I generally do... Uh, is I write on one book for a week to 10 days, then switch to another one for a week to 10 days, then another one for a week to 10 days. Because the first day or so, my brain's still wanting to go, wait, which one are we doing? Um, but the beauty of Beast and Queen, A, they're in the same world, they have a few of the same characters, and Beast is backstory for Queen. So normally, like with Beast, I have to figure out what's the backstory here. Like what happened between these two ten years ago? Or, you know, what would have made them come to this point in their relationship? Da 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 da. The beauty of Queen is that the backstory is the other book that I'm writing. <laughs> so uh, when I'm plotting Beast, I'm creating world building for Queen. So they actually help each other in that way. And I'm also, when I'm writing Beast, I know where I'm going because I have to get it to Queen. So they they work together that way. It's a lot easier to write Queen after Beast than it is to write Prince after Queen because Prince is a completely different world and different characters. So it usually takes me a day or so to kind of get back into the flow of the new world. So then it must have been really hard then when you were doing Beast and um, uh, CEO. Uh, CEO, yeah. Yes. Yes. And Prince. Had, at one point, because I was writing Prince for two and a half months before it came out, but only in little pieces because I knew that it wasn't going to be needed for a while, so I would just work on it here and there. But yeah, at one point I was writing... Oh, there... No, yeah. At one point I was writing... CEO, which is Dane's story, and Reth, and Eaton and Aelith's story. And, yeah, and like I say, for the first day or so that you're in a new story. But but one of the things I use, I use um, playlists that um, are music that I find either there has the tone of the scenes and the characters or the lyrics match, uh, character motivations and thoughts and stuff. So that helps me because my brain hears the music and it shifts back into, because like when I listen to those playlists just for fun, my brain's constantly filtering through the characters because they're so intertwined in my head because I'm just playing them on loop while I'm writing. Um, so the playlists help. I also go back and read a couple chapters, the couple of the last chapters. The tricky part of that with Beast and the multiple point of view right now is that I've got two different worlds and four different pro plot lines going at the same time. So I have to go back and read 
the previous plot, the previous chapters for that character's point of view. And then sometimes I have to figure out, wait, what's happened in the interim? So like, for example, if you're in Gari's point of view or Elia's point of view, sometimes I have to read Gari's and Callie's as well to remember where Elia's at. Because sometimes you're getting Elia's story through their eyes and vice versa. Sometimes you're getting Gari's story through Elia's eyes and stuff like that. So yeah, it's Beast is definitely a lot more complicated to write in volume two. But it's also a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun with Laren. Um, he's probably the most interesting character to me right now, his story. I love villains. I love villains. So he's, he's a lot of fun to write right now, um, especially when Reth's in such a negative place. <laughs> Because I just it just hurts me every time I'm writing him right now. I'm just like my poor baby. <laughs> He's so sad. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I have to switch between, and it's hard. But once I get the flow going, it's fine. Because I'm just back in that world, and it's not a problem. Is it hard though to emotionally detach yourself when like there's something going on, and then you're done writing, and then you've got home life? Actually, it's the other way around. It's hard not to, it's hard to focus on writing when things at home are either tough or busy. So because of COVID, my husband is home most of the time working. And my son, because it's summer break, is home all the time. And anytime there's stuff going on with them or they're just bored and they want to interrupt me and talk to me, um, it breaks. What, I, what I'm learning about myself this year in writing serialization, which is a much, much higher word count requirement than previous writing that I've done. What I'm learning is that my creative brain needs to get into a flow. And once I get into a flow, it comes pretty easily usually. But if that flow keeps getting interrupted, it takes a few minutes to get back into it. And if it gets interrupted again, it takes even longer to get back into it. And so I've been struggling a lot this year. There's been a lot going on. My husband's had surgery. My son's had issues at school. There's been different things going on in our personal lives. Like, It's really hard sometimes when you're trying to be creative and your personal emotions don't match what's going on with the characters. Or there's these constant interruptions and your brain's trying to switch gears between reality and fiction. <laughs> a lot. So, yeah, that's been a real challenge this year. But it's worth it. We love it. You guys are great. Like, I don't, I honestly, I sit there sometimes and just, I'm just, I'm just blown away. I'm like, I can't believe that they want to know the intricacies of my, my world like I'm that way as a reader myself like I wish I wish I could sit down with Sarah J Mass and just pummel her with questions about um, A Court of Thorns and Roses that whole series just adore except the most recent one I didn't like where she went with that but prior to that love that series and I would love to sit down with her like this and be like ooh so what did you think um but I, and I've always wanted that with readers too, but I just can't believe that it's actually happening now because I've been doing this for a long time. And I've never, I've had here and there, I've had people that have wanted to have these conversations, but I've never had like more than one person at a time, <laughs> at least not very often. So it's You're in all awesome heaven. I am. I really am. Like I tell people like my dreams are coming true right now and I'm not even making but loads of money. Like it's just, and they're just like, What? I'm like, you don't understand. They all wanna know. They all care about the characters. And I have Hello. readers that come on to Web Novel and comment about thinking about the characters when they're not reading. And I'm that way too. Like I'll do that too with when I'm really invested in a book and I'm washing dishes or I'm going for a walk or whatever, I'm thinking about it and I'm wondering about things are going I'm just I cannot believe it's actually happening it still blows my mind every day I, I come into the discord and I think they won't be there today <laughs> <laughs> they'll all have stopped caring <laughs> oh no it'd probably be like oh my gosh I wish they'd leave me alone now 
<laughs> no, well, I hope it never, I hope, I think the only time that would ever happen is if I got somebody who was kind of creepy. That would, that would not be fun. But I haven't had any creepy people, so I'm really glad. <laughs> Note to self, do not stalk you. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. The minute you start coming to me with facts that you learned off Google, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> there's, oh, no. there's a question here from Rachel. Does the pact that was made between the creator and the guardians in the human world being unable to cross the traverse have to do with why the bears are so adamant about not going through the traverse? Yes and no. Um, the main thing that that pact is about, or that curse, they call it a curse, um, what it was mainly designed to do was there was an awareness that the world of anima is very um, appealing and that the anima people in general are very, um, humans are very drawn to them. And there was a, an awareness early on, it became apparent that any human, humans who became uh, really aware of and working with the anima would always want to end up going to anima and that doesn't work when you've got to be on the other side of the traverse and helping because if everybody keeps disappearing into anima you've never got the guardians there to help when they come back so the original um the original reason that the the curse or the bond was made that wouldn't allow guardians to tr to cross the traverse was to um, make sure that the anima always had human protectors when they came into the human world because there's a lot about the human world that's different and the anima are a much smaller population so if they were wiped out they would be wiped out quickly by humanity so the, they've got to have some protection when they come into the human world not physical protection because they're a lot stronger than human beings they needed people to help them navigate um, and because there's things that they do like stealing humans for the right of survival uh, they needed human agents so to speak on the human side to kind of smooth those things over and keep the animal world hidden from the human world because the whole goal of the guardian bloodline is to keep anima private from the humans and they uh, effectively employed or um, not employed but the guardians get a lot of benefit from being guardians Kelly wouldn't have to work if she didn't want to. Um, and her grandmother really only works because there's so much downtime. Because they're not coming through all the time. So sometimes it's years between anima showing up in the human world. Sometimes it's only weeks. But they never know when they're going to come through. And so the rest of the time they can just be kind of researching and twiddling their thumbs. But they're all provided for. And they obviously have all this knowledge accessible to them that most humans don't have. Uh, which appeals to a lot of people. And um, they get to deal with the anima, who are different and fascinating. Um, so there's a lot of benefit to them to, to being guardians. But the way it works is that even though there's an entire bloodline, like an entire family line that's sort of set up to do this, there's only a couple per generation that get the whole story. Everybody else in that family line, it's kind of like this mythology and they know that their grandparents believe in it and blah, blah, blah. <coughs> but they just kind of see it as a, a fun story because they don't get the evidence. They don't actually get to, they don't live in the big house. They don't get to see the traverse. They don't see the anima coming through. So a lot of the, the guardian bloodline is pretty clueless. They just think they're a rich family. A lot of playboys and stuff in the family because they're just cruising. Um... <coughs> Where'd their money come from? From the anima. So there's resources in anima that are very, very uh, profitable in the human world. And there's a, a mutually beneficial agreement between them that those resources are provided to them, or were, and can still be if they're ever needed. But the guardian bloodline has such lengthy wealth that their wealth makes them wealthy now, if that makes sense. You know, they've been doing it so long that they're old rich. So um, that's why they have this huge house and servants and a, and a full kitchen and staff and all of that because they're, they've always been provided for in that way. And then they have the resources. So if anima come through and they need anything, 
unique or a little bit, you know, criminal, um, the Guardians have the resources to make it happen. In theory. <laughs> uh, Rachel has another question about um, we'll be able to figure out what the voices uh, are in the Regina. Yes. Yeah, that whole thing. That is, yeah. So there's a bunch of stuff that's going to come out through Gari and Callie's research. And part of it will be what and who the voices are. The bears are also going to help with that because the bears know. Um, and so Reth's going to get some of it too. Um, but yes, you will find out what they are. There's one or two people that have already got it. There's one or two people that have commented. Most people haven't got it. Most people have gone in a direction that, uh, which I find really interesting. Um, and would have worked, but it's not the one that I used. Uh, but yeah, I've seen one or two comments from people on Web Novel who have nailed it. And they've figured out what model, so to speak, I'm using for the voices. And um, so it'll be interesting to see what y'all think when we get there. But yes, that will all come out. Callie and, and Gari will learn some of it. And Reth will learn the rest. And then the, that knowledge will get combined and that will feed into Queen as well. I'm going to have to head out in about five minutes. Did anybody else have any questions before I go? No, not me. been lovely talking to you ladies again are you interested in doing this uh we talked about doing it once a month um just for fun and i love doing it so i'm happy to just keep scheduling and i'm gonna try there's a um there's a bot that we can put in discord that'll actually do the announcements for me for scheduled events <laughs> so i think i'm gonna use that because I can't believe that I forgot to I should have been promoting this this week um, yeah I was wondering I was like it must have just gotten cancelled and no. that's why I messaged you I'm like maybe I'll find out I felt so bad Valvix got in touch with me last night and she was like so did that did I miss an announcement did that get cancelled I was like oh my gosh like I literally didn't even know what date it was so I hadn't realized that it was that date <laughs> so it's my bad um, I put reminders in my calendar for the next one, um, so it shouldn't happen again. But if any of you ever realize that we're getting within a few days of a, of a voice chat and we haven't talked about it, please feel free to message me, because <laughs> chances are it drove through one of the holes in my brain again, and I don't want to miss these. I like them. I like them, too. It's, it's the summer. It's having kids home. It is. It, it, Especially if your spouse is working home, too. Yeah. Yeah, our routine is definitely different than usual. So, yes, that doesn't help. Um, but, yeah, that's been a lot of fun. And I appreciate that you guys are interested in all this stuff because it's fun for me to get to talk about things that I don't get to really explain in detail in the book, but I have to figure it out for myself. <laughs> Normally, I'm the only I one I love this. <laughs> I love the birds. That was really cool to learn about what your take on the birds was. Yeah, I, yeah, I was curious about the birds, too. That was a good question. I should probably, um, eventually, like, if Beast goes really big, I'll, eventually I'll get, like, art done and stuff just for fun. A lot of, uh, no, I shouldn't say a lot. I know a, a handful of the bigger authors, and they do stuff like that, and I think that's really fun to have. You know, they go and commission art. Um, and I would love to do that. But right now, right now I'm still making, um, you know, full-time McDonald's wages. <laughs> so we're not, we're not in a position to, to do stuff like that yet. But hopefully we'll see um, if Beast picks up or if Queen picks up or if Queen picks up a Spirity Award or anything like that. Um, I'll definitely work on getting some of that stuff drawn or or represented in some way so that we can have some visuals because I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, 
Anyway, I'm going to have to get going. I'm getting the eyes. Yes, I see you ladies. I will definitely um I will definitely put in so it would be August 8th would be the next one. And what I'll do, like I say if well you're all on the Discord. So I will put it on the Discord so there'll be announcements in the week leading up to it. But if you're listening to this and you're not on the Discord, um and you want to be on the Discord, there should be a link because this should be on YouTube if you're listening to it. And I'll put a link below it. But the other thing that is that you can just be aware that um, if you don't want to be in the Discord but you want to listen, it should be going up in the first day or two after the 8th of August. That's when we'll be doing the next one. Well, ladies, it's been fun. You make my day every time. This is author fun to the max. Well, I have definitely been looking forward to this. Good. We'll just keep doing it. If there's ever any big events coming up, I might do it more than once if there's a new book coming out or something. But other than that, we'll just stick to the second Sunday. Um, and hopefully, if I promote it better next time, we'll have more friends with us. <laughs> I'm surprised this many people showed up. <laughs> I thought me and Citrus might be sitting here. So, how's it going? <laughs> I love it. I would have ate it up, too. I'd be like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> Private author chat. <laughs> She's like, one-on-one, -on -one, hey. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Lame Citrus. <laughs> well, anyway, oh, ladies, it's been wonderful. So, thank you. And I will... Um, I will see you if well I'll see you in the discord obviously but if not before I'll see you next next month be here same time same place definitely and thank you citrus for yes for helping out too she's always my my right hand man she's my brain I love it because my brain doesn't work <laughs> What happens when her brain doesn't work? I know, then we're in real trouble. Y'all better pray for citrus. <laughs> <laughs> hers goes. We're in real trouble. Oh no. <laughs> no, we have Crystal as well. Crystal couldn't come today because she had a bunch of bunnies arriving for their bunny business. But um, yeah, I'll, hopefully um, we might need another mod or two soon. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I gotta run. It was All right, you have a great day. Yeah, I know. Bye. I'll talk Bye, to you. ladies. Bye.